for fear of repetition and duplication, our visitors know that they're welcome, okay? Now, I'm going to begin with Deputy Penrose, who, uh, brought, who, brought, uh, who at his invitation, uh, the delegation will be forced this afternoon. Deputy Penrose. Thank you, thank you. Thanks to the committee for allowing me here. Um, just, I'm going to ask questions because everyone knows you're welcome here. This is a big issue across the Midlands, and everyone is fully aware of that. You want to be sleeping in an ivory tower, not to know. Uh, Mr. Bowder, can I ask you a question? I understand you have been an advisor in relation to the acoustics area. And with your experience stretching back in this area to 1976, you've made a comprehensive submission to the Wind Energy Review Guidelines, as I understand it, there's no taking place. Could you summarise the key points of your submission, and in particular how these impact... Could you please summarise the key points of your submission, and in particular how these noise impacts can affect a quite rural area, as opposed to being part of an industrialised area? and in particular as it relates to setbacks or distances from uh, affected properties. And to Dr Hanney, uh, we know that there are papers produced on both sides of the argument dealing with defects and health, and I think you're an expert on sleep disorders, as I understand from Mr Duncan since the beginning. Could you outline for, for the benefit and our benefit and, the com and for the benefit of the committee from your professional perspective, the impact of noise on people's health and the various types of noise that, that can arise in, in that situation? There'll be inferential noise or low frequency noise or whatever types of noise that the committee are fully aware of. And Mr. Duncan, you might be in a position to address issues in terms of the depreciation or diminution of values of properties and, 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 and things of that area. Thanks for allowing me in. Thank you. I take uh, two more questions with Deputy Pinrose. Uh, the next speaker is Deputy Stanley. Sure, okay. um, and I want to welcome the, the statement as well that you, that you supplied to us. Um, the questions I have is basically is, is in relation to distance and setback, is the first question I wanted to ask. Uh, what, do, what does the panel feel is a reasonable setback? Because you know we have the guidelines there at the moment; it's 500 max, and I'm in one of those counties, County Leash. Uh, in fact, Leash, Offaly, both counties in the constituency are going to be populated with these very quickly, and we're very concerned about it. Um, but uh, what does the panel feel is a reasonable setback? Um, two questions, go here, look, is it? Yeah, or more. Everybody could ask more. But right, I'll okay. do it briefly. D I will be very brief. Thank you, the question of a bond as well, because I, I have concerns that there will be uh, maybe a couple of decades down the line, and maybe not that far down the line, that we could have a lot of rusty uh, turbines populating the landscape, not doing anything. Uh, just the whole question of the need for a bond to be in place to uh, to deal with those uh, and to make sure that there's that there's funding there to remove them. At that point, uh, if they do become uneconomical, which may not happen, but it may happen, um, the question of, of guidelines. Just what's the panel's feeling in relation to the guidelines um, versus regulations? Because you know, or at least statutory limits. Because I think there's a feeling that you know you can catch guidelines and you can pull them around like an elastic band uh, to fit whatever case you want. And certainly, a lot of the people in Leash that I meet, and a lot of local communities and that, and residents in rural areas that are going to be affected, they feel that it needs to be set out in black and white. And um, the whole issue of the moratorium, um, I've suggested that that all parties and independents would sign up to a moratorium here in the in the Oireachtas, that uh, that we would. Uh, have a moratorium until we have prop a proper regime in place, uh, which wouldn't take too long, a number of months, but in the, in the meantime that no planning applications be allowed through uh, and that we don't make the same mistake as we did with the, uh, with the, house, building, uh, with the house building construction uh, madness of the noughties. And I'm just wondering what's the panel's feeling on that, which is support such an all-party uh, Oireachtas um, uh, proposal. Thank you, Deputy. The third um, questioner, Deputy Murphy. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, and I was very pleased that you did highlight the fact that you're in favour of, of, of wind energy. I think most of us are and understand that there's an importance and it's how you do it. That's the key issue. In relation to the Irish, Con Irish Convention, um, I'm wondering if you've considered um, the approach, if the approach actually contravenes that given that people have been signed up in advance. And have you have you considered that whole uh, that that whole um, the, the conflict with going against the principle of it? That's number one. Um, and 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 what can be done about that? Uh, the second issue relates to the. Um, uh, the, the process in relation to uh, the the um, 
uh, I presume it will be, if, you're, if, you, if a planning ap application comes in, I'm presuming that the EPA will have had to have some role prior to it, that the local authorities won't be looking at elements, if they'll be looking at the physical development rather than, for example, noise um, and the other elements that would be of an environmental consequence. Uh, you might just you might just address uh, address that issue, and um, if if there is something that can be meaningfully done there, um, I I I'd agree with uh, Deputy Stanley in re relation to ob obsolescence and the, the whole the whole issue of um, of a bond. But the last question I'd like to ask about our settlement pattern um, is very different, for example, from from the UK, for example. It's, it's very dispersed, you know lots of one-off houses and that. Have you looked at that in the context of, um, of wind energy? And would you make a comment on that for me, please? Thank you, David Murphy. Back to our visitors. OK, so <clears throat> just to begin, the uh, first question was from Deputy Penrose, and we'll take that with noise um, to Mr Dick Bowder. Thank you. Um, can I, can I just briefly just describe the principles of how uh, turbine noise is uh, assessed normally in both Ireland and the UK and most of the rest of the world? Essentially, you start off with measuring the background noise and you then assign a level above that at which the turbine shall not uh, exceed. And what has also happened in both the UK and in Ireland is that in very quiet areas, a lower level has been um, allotted for when, when the noise levels are very quiet. So what you end up with is, um, is a limit to the noise, which is five decibels above background noise, for example. And of course, that varies with the wind speed. So as the, as the wind speed increases, the noise level of the turbines can be higher. But at the very low noise levels, um, you find that uh, the guidance puts a lower limit to the turbine. So you might have a lower limit of 35, 40 or 45 decibels, irrespective of what the background noise level is. So one of the implications, of course, of this is that um, in quite rural areas, the position is different from in, 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 in residential areas, and particularly in mixed residential industrial areas in urban areas. In urban areas, the background noise levels tend to be higher for a start. And the other thing is that people are more used to the noise of traffic and other things going on in urban areas. And those sort of noises, traffic for example, have a similar character, a similar noise spectrum to turbine noise. Whereas in rural areas, a different method of assessment is ideally needed in my view because people are not used to that. They have a much quieter environment and they're not used to um, intruding noises of traffic, industrial noise, and that, that kind of thing. Um, the question of setbacks, um, the, in the Irish guidance at the moment, um, there are lower limits, irrespective of background noise level. And that is 35 to 40 uh, in areas that are relatively quiet, and it's 43 at night, and it's 45 um, in a rather undefined way. It's not very clear in the guidance when that 45 is to be used. In addition to that, there's a setback of 500 meters. The problem with setback is that when the guidance was written, the turbine noise, the, the, the turbine noise at source might have been, for example, 103 decibels. Now, the sort of turbines we're talking about now are probably going to be 107, 108, 109, even 110 decibels at source. So we're talking about much noisier turbines, and because of that, the original setback distance is probably wrong. Personally, I'm not keen, for this very reason, I'm not really keen on having a setback distance, and really a noise limit would be much better because of the variation in turbine noise. Um, just uh, looking to see. In terms of the, um, what you would uh, recommend in terms of uh, setting a noise limit? 
based on on the noise emissions from turbines? Well, well, my my opinion of that this is that we really should be setting a noise limit uh, relative to the background noise level, and not have the lower levels. What happens, you see, is at night, for example where you have a 43 decibel lower limit, the background noise can be something less than 30. So you'll be getting noise levels from the turbines, and this is what people are experiencing now, is you're getting uh, noise levels from the turbines of perhaps 15 decibels more than the background noise. Now, I'm sure when I mention decibels, everybody glazes over <laughs> because you don't quite understand them, and I can understand that. But if I say that 10 decibels, an increase of 10 decibels is a doubling of loudness, so 15 decibels is about three times as loud. So what we're getting is situations where um, the, the noise level of the turbines can easily be three times as loud as the, as the background noise level. And that is basically why people are complaining. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so just to move on to Dr. Chris Hanning, just to give us the perspective from the impact uh, from a sleep disorders perspective and, and, and in that general area on health. We just covered every bit. Was the question just there now, was it? Yes. Okay. The first element of his question on okay. noise. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, perhaps before I start, I might expand a little bit on my expertise to speak on this. Uh, you've heard that I'm a retired consultant in sleep disorders medicine. Uh, I'm also a published author uh, in the field of wind turbine uh, research uh, and health. Um, I have given evidence at planning inquiries uh, in Ireland, in uh, England, uh, in Canada, and given evidence before the Australian Senate. Um, the purpose of uh, setbacks and guidelines is to protect the human population. I think, therefore, that we should look at the effect on the human population in determining what is an appropriate distance uh, between the turbines and human beings. Um, to answer the, the second questioner first, um, and then to expand on it, uh, in my view, and I've held this for some time, an appropriate setback distance should be about one and a half kilometres. Uh, I understand a bill has been put forward uh, for ten times the height of the turbines. Uh, that, I think, would be equally satisfactory. And that, that uh, estimate is based upon existing research done on real human beings uh, at real wind farms. The uh, guideline uh, noise levels uh, tend to have been derived from studies of predominantly traffic noise. Um, and we know that wind turbine noise is several times more annoying than traffic noise for the same sound pressure level. Um, they don't seem to be the same when it comes to their effect on, on humans, uh, in that wind turbine noise is much more annoying and has much more effect. So I don't think it's appropriate to use data derived from studies of traffic to uh, look at or to try to derive noise guidelines. So I think the evidence we have is that um, if people are exposed to an external noise level of 43 decibels, uh, then they are at higher risk uh, of sleep disturbance. One other part of, I think it was uh, Deputy Penrose's question, was on uh, low frequency noise and infrasound. This is a slightly um, unsettled area. We've known for many years that research, uh, that research does show that low frequency noise and infrasound uh, adversely affects human sleep and human health. Um, the mechanism is unknown, but there are some preliminary uh, ideas from Professor Salt uh, in America that the ear doesn't actually respond uh, to inaudible, inaudible sound. But to my mind, it doesn't uh, matter what has actually caused the harm, whether it's low frequency noise, audible noise, pulsatile noise. Uh, we don't wait to take action on a public health issue until every aspect of the causation has been settled. And in my view, we have sufficient evidence of harm from the studies that have been done on existing wind farms to take action now. Who's next? Uh, the next question is about Deputy Stanley, Deputy Murphy. We had a question on property from Deputy, Deputy Penrose. Okay. in terms of property impact. And if I could, might ask the Chair, given the number of questions that are there, will there be sufficient time to, to answer them or should we limit? 
Yeah. If you can just try and cover as many okay. as you can within your, within your response, we'd okay. appreciate that. Great. Um, well, in relation to the property, should I take the questions from one TD at a time, or should we? As you're the floor, deal with as many. Okay, thank you. Well, as, as noted in my submission, in relation, to, I, I, I am an auctioneer by profession. I am a professional, qualified auctioneer, not, not a solicitor, as Dar referred to it. Um, yeah, politics. But uh, as noted in my submission, um, um, much of the empirical evidence uh, in relation to the impact of uh, wind turbines on property values is based on large pools of data extending over a very large area and predominantly from the U United States and looks at evidence of transactions up to 10 miles away from the wind farms. But when you actually scrutinise that data and look closer to the area impacted, i.e. two kilometres, you find that even the reports by the proponents of the wind developments w will uh, indicate an average diminution of somewhere in the region of 25%. And this is a consistent figure throughout all of these reports, you'll see a consistent figure of 25%. Um, the United Kingdom, at the minute, the Department of the Environment uh, have commissioned a report into the impact of renewable energies on the rural economy. It has been reported over there that that report has been suppressed by the Energy Department and Climate Change Department because the impacts, particularly in relation to wind farm developments on nearby properties, are so drastic that it may actually damage the wind farm developments proposed over there. So, there are certain issues we're hoping that that report will be, will be, um, uh, will be published and, and bring some clarity to it. But the, the uh, LBNL studies that are predominantly put forward, which are the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory studies as evidence uh, by the wind farm uh, developers that there are no issues, are, they certainly are flawed. They look up to 10 miles away for the problem, and the problem is very clearly within two kilometres. Um, if we look at the Danish experience, they have a compensation scheme in place for wh where there are uh, issues in relation to it. The RSS, who are the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors in England, have carried out um, a survey of their membership. The consensus amongst my profession, the auctioneering profession, is that there is very definitely an impact on property values, and it is predominantly based on the overall size and dominating impact of the turbines and proximity to SAM. So I would be, and going back to the other question, that uh, uh, Deputy uh, um, Murphy asked in relation to the spatial distribution. You only have to look at Ireland's spatial distribution to see the actual impact that are there. Um, in one area alone, there's one wind farm in Caloocan, and we've actually, in West, in West Mead, we have um, analysed the figures within two kilometres, or 200 homes. The average price of those homes is somewhere in the region, based on the property tax uh, estimates, somewhere in the region of 175,000 euros. If you place that figure of 25%, you're looking at an average uh, equity taken out of those properties of somewhere in the region of 10 million, 8 to 10 million. If we transpose that across the 100 uh, proposed wind farms for the Midlands, you can obviously see that there's a very serious problem looming there. Um, the Let's case is, is something that also, if you, if you bring it back, Article 3 of the um, Environmental Impacts Assessments, uh, this is bringing back to Deputy Murphy's uh, question, Ireland could very well find itself uh, brought into a scenario where they are actually um, potentially brought into, into a case for compensation payments because the planning authority directly responsible for carrying out that environmental impact assessment is maybe on board Panala which drags them into the proceedings and they may well find, if there are consequences thereafter, that the state may well face um, compensation claims.